Amen. We want to praise God for our male chorus and all of our musicians this morning. We thank God for them leading us into worship. And those of you who remember Brother Raymond Hawkins, that was his favorite song. Amen. So we just thank you for that this morning. We want to thank God for this opportunity. We never want to take it lightly when he uh, asks us to stand before us and proclaim his holy word. So we just thank God, uh, first of all, for the anointing. And I thank him for the gift of teaching because I know that that is a spiritual gift that he has bestowed upon me. I thank God for my pastor, the Reverend Dr. Harry L. Seawright. Thank you for this opportunity. I always uh, want to say thanks for uh, trusting us uh, behind this holy desk, and we really appreciate it. And I know the fog that you're in. I know it. It will lift, and it's all right to take your time to do what you have to do. What we do as Christians, we grieve, but we grieve with hope. Amen. And we want to pray for Reverend Sharita in the same vein as we, you've lost one of your, your friends, your aunt. And we just know that God has his hand up on you. And we just thank God for your leadership. We thank you for your prayers. And I always thank Reverend Sharita. She pray for you even when you don't want her to pray for you. I'm like, I don't feel like praying right now. But you know Reverend Sharita is always praying for us. And we just thank God for the leadership of this church. Amen. Uh, we want to thank God for you guys' people. Um, we, we know that you drive by a lot of churches to get here every Sunday morning. We thank you for coming here. And now that we have the internet, we know those who are streaming at home that you have a whole lot of cho choices on the internet. But we thank you for stopping by Union Bethel, Brandywine, Maryland, just to hear from the word of God. I thank God for my children, Reagan and Raina. Um, and I thank God for the blessings that he has bestowed upon their lives as well. So we want to thank um, Brother Rodney and uh, Brother uh, Royster for all they've done this morning. Thank you for reading the scripture. I always tell people to keep your Bibles open while I'm up here because this stuff is so good and I ain't making it up and I couldn't have wrote it myself. Amen. So uh, we always ask that you uh, read in your quiet time as well. But I would ask you to turn to First Peter, the New Testament book of First Peter, chapter two, verses one through ten, and just keep it open throughout the sermon. And we hope that you learn a little bit this morning. Um, I want to thank God for my Bible study group. Y'all have heard this before. You're going to hear it again. And I, I pray that it's just as good uh, today as it was when we, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. So I just thank God for this. Amen. Amen. Let us bow. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again just for being God all by yourself. We thank you, Lord, for keeping us. We thank you for leading us and guiding us, Lord. We thank you for your hedge of protection that you have around us. But now, Lord, we need you to stop by Union Bethel, Lord, because we all need a word from God. We thank you, Lord, for our angels that watched over us as we came here, Lord. But be with us right now, Lord, and speak to our hearts, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that because of what we hear today, that we will leave this place and we will go to our homes, our schools, our jobs with a new walk because we know that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives and also that we all have a work to do for him. We thank you, Lord. We love you. And we glorify you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Um, once again, the um, scripture lesson this morning is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. But I just want to lift up verses 9 and 10 for right now. But we're going to go back to the top in a few. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, and who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. I ask that you pray with me this morning as we preach and teach on this subject, more than conquerors, more than conquerors. Amen? Amen. As you all can see, the theme for this year is more than conquerors. So what uh, the Holy Spirit laid up on our hearts during the Bible study, we always try to teach from themes. So one thing that we need to learn is when uh, God gives our pastor a, a vision or he gives him a theme for the year that we are to see how we are to fit into that vision. Um, and so I thought through Bible study that we could start uh, learning some information about being more than conquerors, amen? So when you think about the word conqueror, you think about different things. A conqueror, if you've been in uh, the military, you know when you've conquered something, you, mo you know that you have defeated the enemy, you know that you have defeated something. You know there are times when we have to capture people in war and people are taken captive and we are victorious, amen? And if we are all of this, if we are a defeater, if we are a captor, if we are a victor, when we are more than conquerors, we are more than all of this, amen? And if we remember St. Peter, Peter walked with Jesus. 
He witnessed all of the miracles that Jesus did. He witnessed his work. But also, Peter did something that most of us claim that we would never do, and Peter rejected Jesus. Amen? But even though Peter rejected Jesus, Jesus still loved him. Jesus still expected Peter to feed his sheep. And part of the feeding that he was doing was writing this letter and writing this epistle to the people to encourage the saints. Amen? Peter writes that Christians are more than conquerors. They are more than a defeater, more than a victor. And in your opinion, and what I want you to do as we talk this morning, I want you to think about some things that God is laying up on your heart to go forward and what you're going to do once you leave this place today. Amen? So in your opinion, think about why is it so hard for Christians to grasp our spiritual power. Amen? We have so much power within us, but we allow things of this world to block it, to block us from hearing from God. And one thing as Christians, we can't just sit in our pity parties. We just can't sit in our homes all the time and not allow the work of God to be done. We have to start thinking about how we can overcome. We go through the different things every day. We go through people that don't like us, people that we don't like, but we need to rise above that because there is a work to be done for God. So as you listen to the lesson this morning, I want you to consider and think about what is your greatest spiritual challenge. Think about that as we go on this wise this morning. The first three verses talks about us ridding things. Verse 1 says, therefore lay aside all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. Think about why is it so hard for us to get rid of these things in our lives? These are things that hold us back. These are things that hold us back from the work that God would have us to do, and it will also hold us back from us hearing from God and hearing His Word. And as you are blocked up with all of this malice and this envy and this hypocrisy, your blessings are being blocked. Amen? We should know that we have blessings that God wants to give to us. He wants to pour out blessings up on us day after day, but because we got our attention focused on the things of this world, of the things that we need to to go for, we are so blocked up that we cannot receive the blessings that God has for us. And in the same vein, we cannot grow. If you are sitting in one place, if you're not reading the Word, if you're not praying, if you're not meditating, you are not growing spiritually. So we have to let all of these things go so that we can grow in Christ. And also, if you allow these things in your life, it takes your focus off what God would have us to do for Christ. Amen? So what Peter says is for us to have a childlike faith, but to not act like children. Amen? Amen? There is a growth period. Those of us who have had children or anything that you've seen grow, you've seen it. it, It's a process. It's not something that happens overnight. And what we have to understand is that we have to, when we first get saved, we're basically on, and we're talking symbolically, we're talking about a spiritual milk that we're drinking. If you think about when you had your babies, they couldn't take a steak right away. Now, now some of those guys going to the wild thing, I think that y'all can probably... I don't know. Y'all probably could have eat, eaten a steak right away. But, but we're on, for the most part, we're on a spiritual milk. We can take a little bit at a time, but as our bodies grow, there's more and more stuff that we can take in, more and more items from God that we can take in, more and more blessings that we can take in from God. And if we, um, sometimes if we do stuff out of order, it will, uh, it, will, it will stun our growth. It will stun our spiritual growth. So we have to take time Everything's a process. Go through it, and we have to take time to grow, uh, go, grow correctly. Peter says that we should grow up in our salvation. Now, how do we do that? How, I, if I'm going to grow up in my salvation, here I am, a grown 52-year-old woman. I'm already grown. Physically, yes, I am, but have I grown spiritually? How did I grow up in my salvation? I grew up in my salvation, first of all, by reading the Word. All you got to do is read the Word. I just thank God that years ago, Reverend C. Wright told us to get the one-year Bible, and um, I just love it because every year that I read it, I see something that I didn't see before. I'm like, okay, God, when did you insert that in there? But it, it was the fact that it was always there, but uh, one thing that we have to do is read the Word. I can sit up here and tell you anything. If you don't go back tonight and start uh, verifying what I say, you're going to believe everything that I say, but you need to read the Word for yourself. It's great that we come out for Bible study. It's great that we come out on Sunday mornings, but if you don't pick up the Word and read it for yourself, you're not going to know. You're not going to know God's voice, amen? 
And another way that we grow up in our salvation is through prayer. How many of us take time once or twice a week to get up with the, and do the prayer call every morning? And, you, and if you do something, if you pray, you're listening to God's voice, you're listening for him, you're petitioning him, you're thanking him for who he is, and you're asking him for, to direct your day. So if you don't have a constant prayer life, I challenge you, first of all, to pray for yourself. I challenge you to pick up the phone every morning and listen to the, the prayer that's on every morning. And I challenge you to start figuring out a way every day that you can pray and listen for God's voice. Another way we grow up in our salvation is meditating. I always ask people, read, read the word even after we leave. Try to figure out what is it that God would have for you in this word that we're talking about today. And if you start meditating on it, it may not be for you. Some people will walk out here and they're like, well, I ain't getting nothing out of that sermon. I don't know what that old woman up there talked about. And that's fine if you don't. If you don't think it's for you, then more than likely it's for somebody else that you might come in contact with. Amen. So meditate on the word of God. And also, as we grow up in our salvation, we fellowship with other believers. It's great that we are streaming now, but like Reverend C. Wright said, it ain't nothing coming out here talking to our fellow believers, understanding what they've been through during the week. And, that, and Reverend C. Wright didn't write that. That's in Hebrews 10, 25. Fellowship with like believers so that you can encourage one another, so that you can be encouraged, so that you can share what you have gone through and the things that God has brought you through. And then Peter says that there, ha there has been an interaction with Jesus. Now, we know that Peter walked with Jesus from the very beginning, um, and we have to have an interaction with Jesus. It's good that we read the Word and that we, we hear about the goodness and uh, what God has done, but we also need Jesus in our lives. We need to have a personal relationship with Jesus so that we can know His voice, so that we can know when, when, when we have to move. And we have, to get to, we have to get to the point where we have to stop saying something told me. Something didn't tell you. That was the Holy Ghost within you telling you that you have to move, telling you have to pray for somebody, telling you to, when to speak. And also Peter had a firsthand witness of what Jesus Christ did. So he knew that there, he had had an interaction with Jesus. But ask yourself, have I had an interaction with Jesus? I came to this altar. I got saved. Did I do anything with my salvation? Have you had an interaction with Jesus? If you've had an interaction with Jesus, believe me, you are more than conquerors. Amen? Amen. In the second set of scriptures, we talk about building on a cornerstone in verses 4 through 8. Peter wants us to stay mindful that Jesus must be the foundation on which we build. Amen? Amen. Brother Rodney just said that he thought he was just hoping that his house wouldn't blow over last night, amen? But when you build something on a firm foundation, more than likely it's going to stand. Is your relationship with Jesus Christ built on a firm foundation? One of the Gospels talks about building on a house of sand, and it also build, talks about building on a house of foundation. We have to build our spirituality, our spiritual houses on a firm foundation. And if you calling yourself a Christian today, that foundation should be Jesus Christ. But there's uh, times that we try as Christians, we try to be successful without Jesus Christ. We cannot be successful if we have claimed him as Lord and Savior of our lives. In my, in, in my, um, in my job, I, uh, once again, as I stated before, I know that um, God placed me here to teach. I know it. That, that's my gift. I know that's what he, he called me here to do. Um, even on my job here in the church, that's what I'm called to do. And, and I'm headed towards retirement. I'm not there yet, but I'm headed towards retirement. But I know that when I retire, I want to teach. So I've been looking for a job. I'm like, okay, I need something with instruction, you know, going on USA jobs, nothing's there. So I woke up the other morning and the Holy Spirit said, if you want God to do this for you, why are you doing all the work? Amen. Why are you doing all of that when God says that he will make way for your gifts? Amen. So one thing I want us to do as we leave here today, think about what you love to do. Think about what your passion is. That is the spiritual gift that God has for you. That is written in the Bible, and it was written a whole lot longer before Steve Harvey said it. Amen? It's in there. So think about that. So as we go forth, we have to understand that if I want to be successful in my teaching, I've already um, uh, been allowed by my pastor to build a foundation here at uh, Union Bethel with my teacher. My job has sent me on some instructing things. So I know that that foundation in my spiritual built is already there. And then 
He refers to the cornerstone as the most important stone in the building. Brother Christopher, you remember a couple weeks ago when we were talking about this, we always talk about Jesus being the chief cornerstone. And I'm like, you know, we never really research that. We never really talk about it. So Brother Christopher Google, isn't, isn't the internet just wonderful? He Googled it. And the, the cornerstone was defined as the first stone that's built, and the others are made in its, in its likeness. So the other stones are made like the chief cornerstone. Who is the chief cornerstone in your life? We are Christians, which means we are Christ-like. Amen? So if we start building on the chief st- cornerstone, which is Jesus the Christ, then we are growing in his likeness. We are compassionate like he is. We love like he is, like he does. We want to provide for others like we is. We want to see people heal because of God using us to heal others. Amen? And Jesus was and continues to be rejected by people. And if we are Christ-like, if we are trying to live as righteously as possible, then people are going to reject us. Amen? Y'all agree with that? So don't be surprised when you are rejected because of doing what's right. I tell people you never have to explain why you did what was right. Amen? And so we should try to live as righteously and as Christ-like as possible. So when people reject us, we should not be surprised. But once we start planning everything that we do, and the likeness and the foundation of Christ, we know that others are not going to like it because the Bible tells us that demons tremble in the presence of Christ. Amen? So don't take it personally. They rejected Jesus, so we're, not, we're nothing compared to him. So if they rejected him and he went on to do the work and the will of his Father, amen, are you continuing to do the work and the will of your Savior, Jesus Christ, what God has called you to do? Amen? And also... We have to understand that we are commanded, and some of y'all might not like this, but we are commanded, we are told to pray for our enemies. Amen? Now, I don't hear too many amens on that, but we are commanded to pray for our enemies. And so I can stand up here and say that, but if you start thinking, uh, why is that so? Verse 8 tells us that those who reject Jesus, the cornerstone, they will stumble and fall. So if people are rejecting the Jesus Christ within you, those people are going to stumble and fall unless they choose to do what's right. Now, if they choose to to do that, then it's not on you. You've done what God has commanded you to do. You have prayed for them. But if they choose not to do what's right, they will ultimately fall into failure. And we see them, and sometimes we want to see it. I'm like King David. I read some of those psalms sometimes. I'm like, I want to see this happen to my enemy. Lord, do this. But God said, that ain't, he said, you ain't God, so that ain't what I called you to do. So we have to be careful not to envy evildoers and then not to do what they're doing. Because a lot of times you want to do exactly to them or say exactly about them what they're saying about us. But if we continue to rise above God has called us to rise above. He's, he's called us to set a standard as Christians in order to go forth in his will and not worry about all that mess that's all around us. We, we don't have to worry about people. And we have often said it here from this pulpit, from the teaching at Union Bethel, that if, if the uh, evildoers or if our enemies don't change, then God is going to change us. Amen? And help us to rise above it. And... We also have to understand that we should not desire the wealth of, of the world without understanding that God is the source. Once again, we go back and understand that God is the source of everything that we have and understand also that you see some people prospering, you see some people who are wealthy, they will never see heaven because that wealth is their little G God. But we have to serve the big G God, amen? He is their original God. He is the only God that we should be serving. And once you start doing that, Matthew 6, tells us, once you start uh, laying aside everything of the worries of this world, that God will add everything unto us. And that's what we should be looking for. So verses 9 and 10 tells us who we are in Christ. Amen. It tells us that we are a chosen people. And once again, start thinking about these things. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation, and we are God's special possession. Think about being a chosen person. I always think about relationships when you go into marriages and stuff. A lot of times we can choose who we, who we uh, want to be with or who we desire to be with. We can choose a job. We can choose certain things. God chose us. 
God chose each and every one of us to do something. Even if you have not uh, acknowledge Jesus as your Savior yet. He still chose you, but God is waiting on you. Maybe today is the day, maybe tomorrow is the day, but you are a chosen people, and we are also a royal priesthood. As we are in the midst of Black History Month, we reflect back on our, uh, our uh, people from our African nations. We had kings and queens who were taken into slavery, but before they were taken into slavery, they were kings and queens. They were royalty. Look at yourself as a royal person in God. Look at yourself as, as the person who can walk above and we can rise above anything that is beneath us that would keep us from walking forth with God. And also, how many of us know that the United States ain't necessarily a holy nation? Amen? I mean, we got, we got decrees, we got constitutions, we got all kind of stuff. We got, I think we got in God our trust. Anybody got a penny or something? The dollar is saying, God, we trust, but is the United States a holy nation? We, we try to think that we are above everybody else when it comes to Christianity, but we do not display Christianity. How many, how often, how afraid are Christians of, of, uh, to stand on what they believe? Amen. Brother Rodney talked about it this morning. You have to stand on what you believe if you're going to be a holy nation. You can't just give God lip service and say, okay, we're going to open up this congressional hearing with prayer and whoever. And at the same time, you're all ready to, to mean mug your president. You're all ready to mean mug everybody that's trying to do what's right, trying to do what's for the people. So we have to start as a nation of one. Amen. If ain't nobody around you else acting righteously, if they're not doing right, then you be that holy nation. Don't look for the president to make you a holy nation. Don't look for the congressmen and the senators to make you a holy nation. God will make you a holy nation. And then from there, you will spread in your communities. You will spread in your church. You will spread at your job. Your children will spread at their school. And it will be everything that we need to become our whole holy nation who are for Christ. Amen. And then we are God's special possession. Think about the one thing or the one person that you prize the most. Think about that for one second. I love me some gold. Ooh, I love some gold, just in case anybody wants me to buy me a gift. I love gold. So I got, you know, I don't have a lot, but, you know, what I have, I love it. And if you think about the love you have for a certain thing, love you have for a certain person, think about God who is spiritual who loves you and calls you his prized possession. Do you feel like you are God's prized possession this morning? If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are God's prized possession. If you have not chosen Jesus Christ yet as your personal Savior, God still looks upon you. He still sees you through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, as one of his prized possessions. So think about as we leave here today, once again, you are God's special possession. And then Peter tells us that once we were not a people, but now we are a people of God. Um, I'm the type of person I when people used to knock on my door on Saturday mornings, I used to hide. I used to peep out the window and see who they were. I, I, I'll be waiting for people to come knock on my door now. And I've told this particular thing in, um, in a Bible study before, but a, a gentleman knocked on my door with his, his uh, cohort one day, um, and he was talking about the Christmas season. He said, well, you know a lot of people get depressed. So I cut him off. I said, yeah, people get depressed. I said, but those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, I said, we still have hope. We still know that one day it's going to be all right, even though it's rough right now. And even if it don't get better, we know we're going to be all right. And he said, um, and, I, and I mentioned that, you know, we'll be spending eternity in heaven. He said, well, how do you expect to spend eternity in heaven when God has only promised heaven to 144,000 people? And so I knew the scripture that he was referring to in Revelation where it says the, the, the 12 tribes, they were, it will be 144,000 people from the 12 tribes. But as you read the next verse, the next verse, John says, I saw a number that I could not number, that no man could not number. And I told that gentleman, I told him, I am in that number that cannot number. So if you hear about the Jews and the Gentiles, we are the Gentiles, but I will get in by any means necessary. Amen. If it means that, that, that I am adopted into the faith, if it, I am an heir of salvation. So now we are a people of God. 
And once again, this helps us to understand what, that salvation is for everyone. God wants everyone to be saved. If you say it, if you hear anybody in your family say it, if you hear anybody say, it, well, God don't want to put up with me. He don't want me no more. Rise up out of that pity party. God wants everybody to be saved. It don't matter how bad your enemy is. God wants that enemy to be saved. And we should start wanting the same things for people that God wants for them. And we must understand who God is and how we should glorify him for the things that we have done. And once again, we t think about Peter. Peter is writing based on firsthand witnesses. And once we, and um, Peter also wrote that once we would not receive mercy, but now we, re but now we receive mercy. Once again, keep your Bibles open because I started, you know, losing it there for a minute and then speaking in tongues and stuff. So, um, so, but what it says is that once we would not have received mercy, we now will receive mercy. Think about your own personal understanding of mercy. And the problem with most of us, Christians included, is that we want mercy, man. Amen. We talk about grace and mercy. We wake up in the morning and say, Lord, thank you for grace and mercy. Thank you. But you woke me up that what you didn't allow to happen to me. But are you willing to extend that same mercy to somebody else? Think about it. There's a, a story in the Bible where it talks about this gentleman owed a lot of money to the man, and the man forgave him of that. They said he owed millions of dollars. But here was this other servant that owed this particular man a couple of thousand dollars. That, that man asked for mercy, but he said, there's no way. Go to jail. And if we do that to people, God, the, the Bible teaches us that God will not forgive us. So we have to understand that once we start forgiving people, once we start extending mercy to other people, that we will start to rise higher in Christ and that we will start to conquer this unforgiveness that a lot of us have in our hearts, that we will be able to think about what God did for us, that we have to do it for other people so that God will see the Jesus in us and want to serve him. Think about, it's not about me, it's about God. So I have to be able to extend what God has given me in order to help others become di disciples for God. And think about where we would be if God didn't give us mercy. Again, I wanted this to be a thought-provoking uh, uh, sermon or a word, but at the same time, sit here and think about it. People who are streaming at home, think about it, but then do something about it. We come here Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, probably Tuesday after Tuesday, and we hear it, and we don't go out and do nothing with it. God expects us to do something with what you've heard today. If you are unsaved, God expects you to come to this altar and receive his son as your personal savior, amen? Because guess what? I've told you, I've done what he told me to do. Now he's telling you, he's moving up on your heart to receive salvation because if you choose not to and you leave out of here and die tonight, you will spend eternity in hell. We can only go to heaven, we can only go to hell, and we are going to choose where we spend eternity, amen? So think about it, but then go do something. If you save, then you got to go out and help somebody else, amen? You got to go out and help the homeless during this, this rough season. We have to go out and help ministries that are helping others. We have to help and show Show forth the kindness of God. God said, when you visited me in the prison, that, that was me you visited. When you clothed the naked, that was God that you was given to. And that's what he's going to look. He said, when you've done to the least of these, it is almost as if you are doing to him. So as we leave this place today, I want you to think about and grasp hold of the fact that you are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. Amen. And I challenged you earlier to think about your greatest spirit, spiritual challenge, and how you will overcome it. I hope that we've said something today that will help you to not stay stuck in where you are, but want to rise higher in Jesus Christ. My, my brothers and sisters, you are more than conquerors. God bless you. Who have heard who has heard the word 
um, I don't know about you, I listen to preaching on the way here every Sunday morning, and I, I just can't get enough of, of the goodness of God and the things that he's brought us through. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have not done it on your own. As much as you think that you, you've gotten um, all these wonderful things and that all the, everything's fallen into place for you, you've not done it on your own. We all have to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We're just passing through here. We're, we're just jer- sojourners through this land. Amen. Our souls have to spend eternity somewhere. And so if you don't know, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I beg you, I, I am pleading with you to come to this altar today. And for those of you who are streaming as well, we just ask you to please choose Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. We have pre- preachers here who will pray with you. We ask you to give them your hand, but give God your heart. Romans 10:9 simply tells us that if we believe in, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is our Savior, then we shall be saved. Amen. It's just as simple as that. I, I'm too old to do cartwheels, so he don't expect me to do flips and expect me to do jumps in the air. He just wants me to give my heart to him. So if you haven't given Jesus Christ at your heart at, at, as your personal Savior, right now is a good time to do it. Amen. 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 I, don't, I, I, I heard that wind all night, and I was reminded of Reverend Seawright preaching a couple weeks ago with the Red Sea part. And, and what that teaches us is that all night long, the wind blew. And the wind blew to give us dry ground to walk over on. God has blown the wind through your life today. He has parted any Red Sea problems that you have. He has always been there. He will always be there until the end of time. So right now, if you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Savior, I beg you to do so. Maybe you have received him as your Savior and you've backslidden. And we know we do it every day. If somebody says that they haven't backslidden, had a bad thought or something, then they really need to be at this altar. But some of us, we we need to reconnect. And I always tell people, God never moves. We are the one who move away. Amen. It's us that move, but God is there for us. So if you feel like you have to reconnect to understand being more than a conqueror, now it's the time. And we also, Union Bethel, we also, we are always looking for new members. Amen. We are not a perfect people. But we do serve a perfect God. So if you are looking for a church home, a place to work out your soul salvation, this is a great place to do it under the teaching of preaching of our pastor, Reverend Dr. Harry L. Seawright, and our assistant pastor, Reverend Sharita Moon Seawright. And if you're streaming, I, and if you got saved during the stream, we beg you to find a Bible-believing church. Go somewhere where the Bible is being taught, where Jesus Christ, where the cross is being taught. Amen? Amen. God bless you all. I've had my cheer. All right. Somebody can still come. The altar is still open. Praise the Lord. You still got a chance. Life, ups and downs. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. God's been good to me. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Somebody else want to come? Our doors open. This is your time. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is good. Hallelujah. Today is your day. Today is the day you can be more than a conqueror. Today is the day that you can be better than you were yesterday. In fact, you can be better right now than you were when you came in the door. God is just that good. Praise to God. Somebody want to make a step. Hallelujah. Oh, if anyone should ever
the best thing. He is the best thing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you, man, Chorus. Amen. Thank God. Give God a hand. Praise.